Hi everyone, good afternoon and welcome to all the learners from Emeritus and Eruditus. We are here again for our guest lecture series by Career Services. I am Suganda and I will be moderating this session today. Um, if you have any questions during the presentations, please type them in the Q&A box and I'll bring them up at the end of the session. Our guest for today is Chief Marketing Officer at IBM Asia Pacific, Mr. Arun Kawale. Arun is an award-winning marketing and communications leader with over 22 years of experience driving significant demand and revenue growth across multiple markets and businesses. He has a track record of aligning marketing closely with the business, which has gained him the reputation as a trusted business advisor and partner for driving overall long-term business agenda. A recipient of multiple awards and recognition for his work, Arun was listed in Forbes as one of the 50 best marketing and communication leaders in Asia. He was also awarded the most influential global marketing leader 2018 by CMO Asia and the World Marketing Congress. Along with him, we have Mr. Chetan Krishnamurthy, uh, Director and CMO of IBM Cloud and Cognitive Solutions Asia Pacific. Please join me in welcoming our guests, Mr. Arun and Mr. Chetan. The topic for today is Developing Your Executive Presence, the Secret Source for Career Success. Uh, Mr. Arun and Chetan, welcome and the stage is all yours. Thank you, Suganda. Good afternoon, good evening. Um, and, and it's our pleasure to be here. Um, and this is a topic which is extremely close to certainly my heart. And I know it's, uh, it's something that Chetan also feels equally passionate about. It's about uh, um, executive impact, using executive impact to drive your career and career success. And this is often a topic that doesn't get um, enough mileage, doesn't get um, um, enough people talking about it. So there's a little to go by in terms of getting some direction. Uh, but this is probably the most important piece that determines how far we can go in our careers. This is what translates your merit. Um, and, and your potential into reality. So this is a topic, as I said, very personally, um, something that I'm very passionate about. And so hopefully, um, you know, we will share some insights that you will think are useful for you. Now, we deliberately chose to keep this uh, um, less prepared because the key here is to, is to be authentic. And we have sort of sacrificed preparedness at the altar of uh, authenticity. We just have a few slides and then uh, once we establish the context, hopefully between Chetan and I, uh, we can talk through certain things, share our own experiences and uh, uh, see if it makes sense. And we definitely want to make it uh, fairly interactive, quite interactive actually. Um, and, and, you know, we'll open up for questions and we can make this into a conversation instead of uh, two random people coming in, <laughs> sharing some PowerPoint slides. Yeah. So just as a matter of establishing the context, let's just look at a few pieces here. I'm going to put this on screen, show more. Okay, anybody old enough to know what this is? Or who this is? Or the context? Okay, there's a number uh, 16 here. Any guesses on what this number 16 is? All right, so let me, let me, let me give the answer. This is uh, this is from the classic classic movie called The Silence of the Lambs, which came out I think in 1991. And this is Anthony Hopkins playing the role of Hannibal Lecter. If you guys haven't watched this movie, you got you you know what you're going to do the next two days, Saturday, Sunday, right? This is an all-time classic. Now the reason why I bring this up and the number 16 is this movie. Anybody who's watched this movie, 1991, it's 30 years to the day. Hannibal Lecter and Anthony Hopkins is what I remember this movie by. And the number 16 is in a roughly two hour movie. Anthony Hopkins appears for 16 minutes. 16 minutes. And at 30 years later, I remember Anthony Hopkins from this movie. Okay, keep that in mind. Let's look at another example. For the younger folks out there, this is 2008. Come on guys, you should know this, right? Heath Ledger. Right. The Dark Knight, who can forget this? The Joker's uh, uh, character being played by Heath Ledger, all-time classic performance. The number 33, again, roughly two hours, 10 minutes or something of a movie. 33 minutes is the screen time of Heath Ledger. We all remember this movie by Heath Ledger. We don't remember Batman. It's a, it's a movie about Batman. 
but we remember the movie for Heath Ledger and he was there in the movie for 33 minutes okay close the home any guesses so we have replies on the chat where people are guessing it okay excellent so yeah. hopefully at least one of them you know i i can't see the chat but hopefully you know um people are recognizing the examples yeah damini damini perfect so again it's a fairly old movie i think 90 something 93 94 something bro um possibly older than that um again look a women oriented movie right it's all about this woman called damini but what do we remember the movie for like 35 minutes or so that sunny diol makes an appearance right i mean we all know the dialogues right i mean i'm sure just looking at this video the dialogues are playing in your head again in another instance of how um irrespective of the screen time how a person a character came and made such a huge impression that even after 30 years we remember that little performance more than you know someone who had possibly two full hours of screen time right and further examples right from the world of business world of politics world of sports i mean if you look at all of these these are people who make an impression you cannot ignore them you cannot forget them they make a solid impression in many cases they inspire you they inspire confidence they inspire you to take action they energize you right so what's what's key to each of them i mean it's not about sport it's not about politics alone it's not about movies it's not about any one sphere of life right i mean we saw some examples that cut across multiple aspects of um you know lives and spanning multiple professions but what's common is every single one of these examples every single one of these people that we saw had that secret ingredient that's what we are calling as executive presence you could define it as screen presence you could define it as sporting presence or whatever dash presence right fill in the blanks presence but in the context of business we call it as executive presence now again this is a this is a topic that you don't get too much of literature out there and therefore obviously you won't get too many definitions and deep dives there but for the sake of moving forward for today's discussion let's loosely call it and define it as a, a an aspect of your personality that lets everyone around you know that you are in charge inspires confidence and of course you know assures the people around you that you are capable of leading others yeah now there is a formal definition that one of these uh, exec coaches offered i mean there's a ton of them but i thought this one was very interesting because i think it takes the the, the definition that we just spoke about and sort of breaks it down a few additional layers right i won't read through this but few things here right executive presence is not just about how you show up in front of your bosses it's not just about managing a client it's about you bringing your full personality to your work environment it could be about how you of course show up and work with your subordinates right how do you how you inspire confidence in your teammates but it's also about you know how do your peers perceive you you know do you inspire confidence among your peers as well that you are capable and can be relied upon and of course the most obvious one you know to your senior leadership what is the message that you know you send out each time that you interact with them you know do you inspire confidence among your your leadership that you can be trusted to take on greater tasks and accomplish them with the panache and style that's that's this whole package around executive presence i thought i saw a hand go up um how do we do this sudanda do we do you want to read it out or do we give them the option to uh, ask questions we can take up or... the question and answer at the end if that's okay that's fine that's fine i mean yeah. whichever whatever works for you guys yeah so sure. okay so why is executive presence important i mean we saw some random stories of movies right i mean you could say i'm so far away from the world of you know, movies and the world of whatever politics and so on and so forth i'm just trying to earn my living you know doing a job and doing it fairly well so why is it important look as long as we harbor ambitions of growing in our career we got to make sure that we are working on building our executive presence because this is the link and i think i said this at the very beginning of this uh, session this is the missing link or the secret sauce between the merit 
and the actual success the potential and the realization of that potential how often do we see you know our own colleagues you know your classmates right i mean you will see people who are your classmates you shared you know potentially the, the same desk and bench and then 10 years later you see that this person has gone on to achieve fantastic things and you wonder hey you know this person was not really so much better than you were how come this person reached and be very easily and conveniently attributed to luck sure luck has a role to play but like they always say right luck always favors the one who's prepared so this is about this is about shaping yourself into a, a rounded personality and bringing up your 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 full authentic self delivering executive presence to the environment that you operate in this is what we call as luck but there is a science behind this luck and that science is called as executive presence okay now again um i mean there are a few books out there which will tell you what you need to do to develop executive presence uh, i am not going to rehash from those books i'm sure you can do a google search and find enough content out there but what i would do is again i i want to keep this authentic so i'll share what i think work for us and what i think is important right the five things that i personally believe you can do today to start building your executive presence right i think the first and foremost piece is you got to manage your emotions why is this important is um a key aspect of leadership is when people come to you at times when they don't have answers within themselves so they come to you hoping for help hoping for guidance hoping for direction right now they don't come to you if you are an agitated person or if you are an equally or more confused than they are they come to you only if you are seen to be someone who's self assured someone who's decisive someone who can manage their emotions well so it's absolutely critical if you don't take anything else from this slide the one thing that you need to take is this item number 1 here which is managing your emotions if you work on your insights the outside will sort itself very often you know we spend a lot of time focusing on the outside you know dressing well and saying the right things and all of that all of that is important but all of that is like what i call as um, uh, applying lipstick on a pig at the end of the day it's still a pig right so so what's super critical is you work on your insights which is about managing your emotions because that is what inspires confidence item number 2 here on my list is be known for something you can be a nice person it's important but let's also understand that we are in our jobs for a particular reason and that reason is that specific skill or capability that we bring to the job so we got to be known for something we got to command respect for what we bring to the table so be known for you know your your piece of the business be an expert in be a ceo for your own little territory right think of yourself as a ceo you could be a sales person for i don't know say delhi south right area sales manager for delhi south or marketing manager for i don't know um, you know mumbai north but please reframe your role as i am the ceo for delhi south i am the ceo for mumbai north when you frame your mindset in that fashion suddenly you will no more be passing the buck but you will become the expert you will understand everything that is needed to understand to deliver that part of your business that is when you become an expert and that's what commands respect so be known for something number 3 on my list is uh, you got to master critical conversation again a very fine topic which unfortunately does not get enough attention very often business is messy and i'm sure a lot of people here have worked for years few years at least and you can relate to what i'm talking about business conversations are rarely easy often times the discussions are conflict resolution in nature where there is a difference in opinion there is no fixed pathways clearer 
so you got to you got to convince people and you got to basically tackle the elephant in the room very often we tend to we tend to side step the thorny issues because we are not comfortable for you to develop your executive presence i would argue that you be the person to address the elephant in the room and do that in a way that results in a win win right it need not be my way or highway it need not be you know a zero sum game you don't need to be wrong for me to be right there is in 90% of the cases a middle path that results in a win win for both i think i mean i can go on but let's let's pause here i mean if there is a further discussion we can always address this on how to reframe some of our own thinking that will help us get to this win win item number 4 is again important we got to focus on the solutions um i mean i say this cheekily but it is true i mean you don't get paid to come up with problems right i mean if you want to really rise up you got to come up with solutions people should be coming to you for solutions you got to be seen as a problem solver that's what gets you your exec presence game going again we can talk more about it on how you can do this uh, at some point depending on how this conversation goes and my final piece that i will leave here is you got to work on building your network and that you can do only when you start sharing your expertise as you go through steps 1 2 3 and 4 you would have built a specific set of capabilities that define you now those capabilities are useful but can be tremendously useful if you start sharing it with uh, others in your network and that's when you build your network and that's when the force amplification happens so cultivate your network um be ready to offer help without asking what's in it for me it may not be obvious what's in it for you today but you know i i think this is always an element of good karma and bad karma in business so share your expertise build your network and be political savvy these are the five things that you know i thought you know there's so many different things out there but these are the five things that i thought can be things that we can start off today of course you can always you know talk about other additional stuff right resiliency you know especially uh the rate at which business is changing uh the rate at which stress levels are going you now resiliency and being stress proof is obviously a critical element i mean there are a few other pieces i we don't need to list down every single thing i think the five things are a good start to get going um so i will leave it here and then at this point uh, why don't i invite chetan chetan thanks for joining um i got this photograph of no if this is your best profile pic or not but i just put it here <laughs> thank you arun thanks a lot <laughs> cool chetan you have been in um, you have been in business you had uh, um, experiences across industries across companies and you had a very interesting career why don't we do this let's play this fair and easy i think uh, let's let's um, i promised you and you promised to us and together we promised to the audience that we we'll stay authentic on this conversation because this is a topic that needs to be authentic Yeah. Um so why don't you you know maybe start sharing your journey a little bit and then we can start making the connections between uh, executive impact and how it has shaped your own uh, career. Yeah, th- thank th- thanks Arun and and hi everyone good afternoon and, and good evening depending on uh, where you are. <clears throat> and and you know and, and Arun I think you hit upon so many uh, you know excellent points on you know just you know not just an executive presence right just in terms of you know how your own demeanor and how you build your skills and strengths and you know how you interact with people and all of that obviously comes to fore right so you know excellent right and it's great to obviously interact with everyone here right i mean you know in terms of you know my own my, my own background actually i started off with uh, you know r&d actually very interestingly you know i i uh, went to college just like i think arun in uh, in uh, in bangalore and then i ended up getting a masters degree in the in the us and i was in a couple of startups mostly doing a lot of r&d uh, like work uh, you know building products solutions um then i came back um you know to india which is probably one of one, a very interesting aspect right because you you know you uh, you know kind of get your master's degree you go to the us you've got multiple options right you got a, you can stay back and then you can come back and you're at these career crossroads in terms of you know what you want to do i decided to obviously you know come back home uh, and then i worked in a startup uh, you know which was acquired at some point of time later on and then i was in a couple of organizations uh, you know nokia and then philips uh, mostly in the area of uh, product 
uh, you know, product management and, and so on. And then I got an MBA, just like Arun, uh, you know, from I am Ahmedabad uh, with, at PGPX, which is the one year uh, full time MBA. And then I was in, you know, Ahmedabad for a year. Uh, and then I ended up moving to Singapore, which is why, which is where Arun and I, I think, have been working together for a few years now. And, and you know, Arun uh, hit upon a number of topics uh, here, right? And I think in terms of developing your own presence, right, and, and eventually culminating to what, you know, Arun defined as executive presence, I think it's that experiences in the journey that have along the way, uh, you have along the way, and what you take away from each of those experiences, right? Uh, I think uh, very early, I think in my career, I kind of realized there is nothing called as good work or bad work, right? There is work uh, and and it needs to be done and it needs to be done with the utmost sincerity as you can because you not only owe it to yourself, but you also owe it to your teammates and your peers and your managers and bosses and so on, right? So that's one thing I think that has kind of stuck on with me. So I've always defined uh, work is work that needs to be done uh, and, and and find that purpose to actually deliver and I think that's a very important uh, you know foundational stone of how you you know develop uh, you know what Arun defined as uh, you know executive impact because it gives you a sense of uh, clarity uh, a sense of uh, calm about uh, you know uh, any any kind of work right whether it's very complex or whatever you de- de- determine it to be right so that's I think one and 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 the second one again arun you talked about you know kind of having these uh, cordial discussions and interactions and and actually building consensus the right way and i think that comes uh, from understanding each other's point of view very early and also being willing to compromise your own uh, you know needs goals in some cases an agenda for the larger cause uh, you know, for a team or for an organization, right? And I think that's something that I, again, got early because of some very good managers that I worked with, uh, you know, who continuously uh, kind of made me see the big picture in things versus, you know, what I am what I am individually doing and how I stand out uh, in, this, in this equation. I think that uh, helped a lot, especially when you're in, you know, very competitive environments where you have a lot of top talent and things like that around you who are probably as good as be- or better than you, right? So you've got to understand where you fit uh, and what your role is uh, very early. I think that helps you shape some of these things. And and I think the third bit that's very important, I think, is communication, right? So you've got to be able to uh, communicate what you're doing very well, not just with, uh, you know, with your peers, but also with your leadership and with your team. And that communication not just means talking, you know, as you can understand well or talking in the right tone or manner, but it's also the clarity in which you communicate, uh, you know, being data point driven, uh, and then as Arun said, being outcome driven, right? And you're talking in terms of solutions, uh, you know, versus problems. So if you start putting, you know, some of these things together, you know, uh, early, mid, you know, whatever stage of your career, I think they kind of help you uh, shape yourself as, you know, as an as an individual, right? So that's probably the three things I would say that helped me a lot. And I think the other thing is, you know, just be open to learning, right? Because you you learn from your peers, uh, you learn from your, uh, you know, teammates, uh, you learn from your managers and bosses and and so on. Uh, I've been lucky to have some excellent managers who have taken time to coach on small aspects, you know, intangible aspects. I think they make a big difference. I think for everyone, I'm, I'm sure many of you have had excellent managers and colleagues that you've learned from. And the last bit, I think, which is very important, I think, is the depth that you bring to the table. And I think, Arun, you talked about it. So if you're coming into a conversation, hey, great, you're a great manager, you have excellent executive presence, but what are you bringing to the table, right? And where is that depth, right? Are you a good data scientist? Are you a good, you know, architect? Are you an excellent marketing professional who understands digital marketing? So you have to be good at something. I think if you bring that to the table, I think, Arun, that's something I think which is, uh, you know, added value for, I would say, uh, both of us. And I think that's critical um, to developing that um, that executive presence, you know, as you said, Arun. So, yeah, these are the things I would kind of say, Arun. Well, thanks. I think uh, you covered quite a few pieces. Um, I, I think, why don't we just dig into a few of these areas and, and sort of, I see a few questions there. Um, we'll, we'll answer those questions, of course. But I do want to dig into some of these areas and uh, I know some of these can be full topics in themselves, but the extent that we can get into today, let's do that. So out of these five, I think you spoke a little bit about most of these things. One of the things, Chetan, and I want to pick your brain particularly on this um, and and see where we land as we go through this discussion is, um, you know, often we see people coming into organizations with a lot of uh, reputation behind them for good work that's been done. People, you know, sometimes larger than life, you know, 
personalities but like you say you know um that initial sheen wears off when when you realize that the substance lacks the form right there's a lot of form but no substance right um these are very obvious instances of how quickly executive presence the shine can wear off but one of the things that i often see and this is like a very tricky issue is you have the respect you you are known for being a subject matter expert um you are very solution oriented um to some extent you have built your network you may not be a natural networker because networking is i mean doesn't come naturally to a lot of people right but you you have built a reputation for yourself as a solid person in your own new sphere but what i see as very often a stumbling block and particularly for people who are trans you know trans trans transiting from let's say middle management to senior management um is this mastery of critical conversations very often you know your, our own strength in a particular subject and our world view sort of becomes um, a handicap in the sense that we start challenging people which is which is perfectly all right we, we are supposed to challenge people but the way we challenge often becomes a detriment to our own careers so you want to talk through how do we hold some of these critical conversations i mean i want to hear from you and then um, um, you know we can answer yeah and i think i think it's an important aspect i think you know arun as you said and everyone here in uh, for development right as we as you rightly said as we move into roles that are bigger impactful broader and so on i think one of the key things you know arun and i think we both discuss this a lot is you know in these conversations first of all i think the key is you know how you bring in first of all empathy into a, even a critical conversation right and and that's i think one of the key things that you got to lead with so so all of us have some kind of what i define as i don't know what the right word for that is like a value system in terms of how you operate uh, and those are things that you have developed along the way from you know from your childhood from your college from all the experiences that you had in, in life right so you have that system so i think when you converse uh, you know and di- discuss some of these critical issues which you think are extremely important for you to move the needle within the organization but it may or may not be the same way that everybody else sees it because this is how your lens or as arun said your view of the world is right because not everybody might see it the same way and and as you said arun it could be because of skills it could be because of their own experiences of you know many many things that come into the picture but i think the key is you know first of all hold that value system as your base when you actually interact with um, you know people the second one i think is when you get into these conversations you have to kind of very clearly understand the point of view of not only what you want out of the conversation but what some of the other stakeholders in that conversation also want because they may or may not intersect right in terms of where you're going right so it it becomes very important that you keep the value system in mind you deliver this with empathy but you also understand what some of the other stakeholders want and then it becomes a very clear you know analysis or understanding of we want to go here x has this point of view y has this and z has this and what's that common denominator i don't know like you always say what is the common de- denominator that we all agree on establish that very very early and then push the boundary from there on incrementally in a very very positive fashion and do it iteratively right i mean it's not a one time conversation you know you have to keep going back and plugging it away and then you know and do this as you rightly said alone with managing your emotions because people don't have to agree with you all the time and and one of the professors around and i'm sure we you know we talk about it had told me this in uh, i'm amdaba they said uh, always remember the only people who really need to be nice to you is your parents uh, you know you may or may not agree but i i somehow i it has always stuck with me so everybody else i mean they have no reason uh, to be nice to you then be nice to you because of their variety of reasons and you need to understand that and keep that in mind and not take it personally uh and and treat this you know as something that you have to do a role that you have to do to move things forward around and that's how i you know generally try to operate and i know you do something very similar as well i don't know what your views are as well yeah well said well said I, in fact uh, that reminds me of what my first boss in many years ago told me uh he told me that uh, um the person is called as your boss and that gives the the, the boss uh, sorry let let me rephrase that essentially on the lines of uh the boss has a reason to boss you around that's why he's called a boss right and you're not entitled to nice things but you have a duty to be nice 
I thought the second statement, which uh, um, I read somewhere a few years ago, was very profound to me because we often think that we have an entitlement, you know, to be treated nicely, but you know, that's it, right? We we don't need to owe anybody anything else. But it should be the other way around. We have a duty to be nice to people, but we cannot feel entitled to be treated nicely. So. So that's. I just wanted to comment there. Now, just to pick on some of the things that you said, I thought very appropriate. To me, what struck and I completely agree with you are three things. Right? One is authenticity. Second is um, um, fit for purpose at that point in time. Uh, and the third was uh, um, willingness to accept that you know you could be r- wrong at certain times we will come to that authenticity to me is extremely important i think very often organizations want to drive a similar culture which is great which is important because at the end of the day an organization is a living organism so it needs to have a certain dna which is what we call as culture it's important but i think we got to not use that as a permission to kill individual authenticity authenticity your ability to bring your authentic self to your day to day work environment and if you are a manager get, getting or giving your teams your employees the permission to bring their authentic self is super important to me i, I, I know that it is important to you to check and again we have spoken about this it is supremely important that you encourage and in fact not just encourage but celebrate the diversity of opinion um you know some people are built differently so accepting and celebrating that difference is is absolutely critical for you to get respect and i would argue that that goes a long way in building your own network within the organization so that's the first piece around authenticity the second piece around fit for purpose this is this is this is an interesting notion right i think you know a lot of us are trained as engineers which means uh, you think there is every problem has a particular solution and that is the only particular solution unfortunately or fortunately in business there is no unique solution there is only a workable solution and a non workable solution there is no best solution right i mean given the circumstances given the constraints this is probably the most workable solution so recognizing that there is it's not a binary discussion right or wrong i think we, you talked about this just an earlier is important so what you hold dearly as right maybe in that situation may not be the best course of action so acceptance of that that brings me to the third piece right which is acceptance of okay so in this instance my world view is not right uh, and i don't need to take it to my heart because again it's all situational so being pragmatic goes a long way in accepting the and driving this critical conversation ability and i also think it's it's a lot of uh, reframing how you define and look at the problem itself we often look at the problem in in an adversarial manner which is i am right i want to do all the good stuff but this person is wrong because this person is always like this which is uh, i think you have heard me talk about this chetan in one of the other uh, uh, discussions um we got to be more objective than that we are, we assign all the objectivity to ourselves and all the subjectivity to the other person all the positivity to ourselves and all the negativity negativity to the other person i think if you just reframe the discussion as everything good about me but everything bad about the other person take away the beauty and replace it with an and then suddenly you can find a way to make both the twain meet so there is always a you know middle path it's just a question of how desperate we are to search for that middle path there is always one middle path that we can find which will help us go a long way it may not be you know quote unquote the best solution but uh, i think that's a you know if you can maintain a relationship and keep the people issues at bay i think that probably is a better solution than any other hard food solution that you come up okay um so when should we take some questions now yeah sure so um 
All right. The very first one is from Ranjit. Uh, he's asking, can you explain more about being politically savvy? Okay, politically savvy. I'm. I'm not the best politically savvy person around, so I will defer to Chetan here. <laughs> Look, I, you know, this is this is my interpretation, right? I think, I think, um, you know, first of all, I think there shouldn't be any connotation uh, to the word, uh, you know, uh, the the cultivate your network and uh, build a political uh, savvy. I think, I think, to me, the how I look at it is, you know, as it clearly says below, right? Share your expertise. I think is a very, very important tool uh, for building networks and actually being, you know, uh, pervasive within an organization, right? Many of us, I think, as individuals from a young age, you know, from school and all of these things, we're so used to, you know, focusing on how much marks did you get, how much did you get. I, at least I went through that very early in my career. You kind of forget sometimes that you have to, first of all, share your expertise with your peers and friends along the way, right? At some point of time, you realize that's a very important piece. And I think to me, within an organization, however skilled you are and how much ever you want to differentiate yourself, that cannot be the, the goal. That's not why you are there. I think one of the most important things that we need to do is make sure that your expertise and your skills are actually spread within the organization so that you can lift everyone. It doesn't matter they are with your they are in your team, whether they report to you, whether they are, you know, your peers or whether they're some organization you work with. The key is to spread that knowledge and that information pervasively, you know, across the organization, right? And to me, a lot of the things related to network, being savvy, whether it's, you know, whatever uh, notion that you attach to it, I think it becomes important that you behave in a way that you're actually trying to lift the overall organization and doing it genuinely and authentically so. When you do that, you really don't have to go out of the way to actually be anything different than what you are if you actually practice and preach that every day of your life, right? Um, and I also reflect back on something Arun was saying. I have a young son, right? I mean, and who's like five and a half. Arun, Arun knows him uh, well. Uh, when I teach him math, I'm, I was still reflecting on what Arun was saying. And this comes back to this point, is that I always tell him in maths, there is one answer, right? Right now, I'm telling him there is one answer. Sometimes he says it's maybe 14, maybe 19, right? But I tell him there's no maybe, it is 14 or 19. But as we go along our careers and, and it, it, it is a maybe, because there are multiple answers and all you can do is you can skill up people within the organization and you can be you know kind of authentic with everybody so that you can lift the level overall to such a way that it becomes more deterministic the answers start getting more and more deterministic because more and more people believe that is the way to go within the organization right and that's the only way you can rally your broader uh, you know uh, troops right that's what, that's how i kind of define uh, you know being savvy i think in a good way that helps yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. I think, Chetan, um, I was just joking uh, initially, but I'm 100% with you on this. I think the negative connotation that often gets attached to the word political savviness is, is, a, is, a, is a harmful notion because uh, it takes away from the importance of the topic. It um, you know makes people shy away from attacking this topic with the energy that it deserves. Um, I mean, there is nothing negative about being politically right. Um, it's It's important. It's it's good. It's important, and you know it's imperative. If you don't do it, uh, you're harming yourself. Um, and again, you know, I think one of the key aspects of um, savviness, whether it's building the network or being politically savvy, is, is the consistency of you know doing the same things. You cannot decide. You cannot say that on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm going to network, and on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, I'm going to be a jerk. It doesn't work that way. If you want to get invited to my house on a Saturday evening, you better be consistent Monday to Friday. Don't just show up on Friday evening and say, hey man, how are you? It doesn't work. It doesn't work in life. It doesn't work in business. So consistency of um, you know, your behavior, your emotion, how you are perceived, how you show up is ultra critical. Right. Thank you. Um, Ruchi is asking how to create a win-win situation. Okay, this is, um, maybe I'll take a first stab at it Chitin, and then uh, you can uh, jump in with your thoughts. I think one of the important pieces is, um, I think we spoke about this a uh, couple of times earlier um, in the session. It's about reframing your own mindset. Maybe let me try and um, um, add to the, the discussion that we had a few minutes earlier. So very often we, we talk about um, 
we 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 often use sentences such as um i wanted to drive this campaign but this person is blocking sounds familiar i mean you replace the campaign with whatever else right so you, you see there are two statements there there is a front end which is whatever comes before the but and then there is a second part which is whatever comes after the but the first part is about you it's objective because you are talking about what you are trying to do it is not about you as a personality it's about what you are trying to do it's very specific um and it's positive right you are trying to do good right but you look at what happens after the but statement it is not specific it's about a person's you know personality not about what that person is doing it's about that person is a blocker that person is always you know running against me it's always trying to put me down stuff like that so it's not specific it's not even objective it's like subjective you know if you tell me this person is bad i mean it's your opinion right it's not a fact but if you change that to a specifically what this person is doing then there is a chance of it being a fact as opposed to being an opinion and it's obviously negative so my challenge here is can we first of all take away the but you keep your statement whatever is in your mind the way it is let it be there take away the but replace it with a and and now read through the same statement i want to run this campaign and this person is blocking some of the english doesn't gel so you will start changing so instead of saying this person is blocking you will say this person needs resources for it to be delivered so now you see exactly what that person is doing is being articulated in a more specific fashion but now it gives you an opportunity to fix now you know but does it mean that by throwing in a few additional resources this person will actually help you get to your objective potentially yes so my point here is there is an opportunity there is a way to make both this you know both the sides coexist that's what we call as win win right it's just a question of rewiring our thinking i think i mean i cannot stress enough it's got to be internal rewiring it cannot be a fake you know oh today i want to be a very super collaborator so i'm going to you know collaborate you know you cannot wake up one day and say i'm going to collaborate today it's not a to do list today it's an internal rewiring that you need to do and how do you do that you got to do this you know day to day you got to check yourself am i thinking every time you come across a conflicting situation at least what seems like conflicting can you reframe can you put the trust in the other person also to be doing the right thing from the lens that that other person holds right so instead of saying this person is bad can you think of you know maybe this person's kpis are written in such a way that this person's kpis are these 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 things so how can i make this person deliver to your expectation while staying within those kpis so it's a it's a reframing of our own thoughts chetan you want to add anything to it i think you said it beautifully aram i think probably take more questions i think so it's very very well Great. So, um, Rashika is asking, how can an introvert build up network without changing the personality? Oh wow! Um, I think we had a discussion. Uh, was it Chetan yesterday? Uh, that podcast that you were doing, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is a very common topic, right? I mean, look, I'm an introvert. I, I know, of course, you know, Chetan is one. but again let's leave aside the very stereotypical you know views of what we believe an introvert does or doesn't do and what an extrovert does or does do those are convenient buckets we often put people in um and and i can tell you these things change over time right i i used to be i mean if you have done the uh, the personality test you know i used to be a entp once upon a time now i think i am i n EJ or something like that. So anyway, the E has turned to I, extroversion has turned to introversion. So the point I'm trying to make is these are not cast in stone. It's not like your blood group that it cannot change. These things can change. The circumstances that you go through, the situations that you put yourself in change. Having said that, there is nothing wrong about being introverted or extroverted. Um extroversion does not mean that you build networks very easily. 
because we got to go back to the definition of what a network is a network is not just about how many people's hands you shake right it's not about the quantity it's about the depth of those relationships right so an introvert may shake fewer hands but if that effort is being put together in 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 pursuit of more meaningful networks more meaningful relationships i think there's a lot more to gain than just going around shaking you know 10 times more hands kitan would you like to add no oh, i mean i don't i think i don't cover it i think it will be good to cover more questions that he's covered it absolutely sure so swasha is asking um, i'm sorry one second Yeah, so she's asking. My question stems from a real life incident. Uh, for people who are just starting out in the industry, how do we build executive presence? Since the most commonly played attitude towards pressures is uh, they lack the relevant experience, or when you have X Y Z years of work experience, you'll realize. So, how do we tackle this? Yeah, I mean, I can I can take this one. I don't. I think I think this is. something i have surely faced uh, you know very early in my career and i think it was not said negatively to me anywhere because like i said i you know have had some good experiences al- along all the companies that i've been in uh, i think i think in a way look i mean what basically many of them are trying to say is you know you've just come in for example into the industry and you may or may not have seen some of these complexities that will arise as you as you go forward right and i think the solution for some of these things is to seek out problems um you know i always keep saying if you want to have problems you know find problems at work like you know keep looking for problems at work like find problem areas where you think that you will be exposed to something beyond what you are actually seeing in your current you know job right or current project or whatever that you're working constantly seek out problem areas there could be challenges if you're in a tech industry for example you know you have challenges with workflows or if you have ch- challenge in some area of the product which has some performance issues If you seek out some of these challenges, I think along the way people will start looking at you as someone who is willing to jump into unknown situations and do your best, right? And it's very likely that we may or may not come out successfully in many of these things. I mean, it's it's not humanly possible to succeed in every possible situation that we are in. But I think if you seek out problems, if you start pushing your own comfort zone, and if you personally invest your time early in your career, I think it will reward you very well. because people will start seeing you in a very different light and the and the situation will now turn from hey 10 years you will see this 10 years from now the conversation will shift to hey would you be interested in doing something like this which will be a little more incremental a little more incremental and then i think you'll start seeing growth you can start getting more respect and it becomes a cycle right and that's how i think it's more of being proactive and seeking out um, you know challenges and problems that's what i would say uh, very and do this very early in your career right i mean don't uh, Don't wait. There's always people who stop you. Uh, that's fine. I mean, you just have to keep keep trying, right? Just start keep trying. Don't give up. Just try, right? I mean, that's how. And you will know at some point of time whether it's not the right place for you. You need to go somewhere else. Uh, yeah, you need to go somewhere else. But you gotta, you know, continue to try. So don't don't give up. Don't change. Um, you know, keep uh, keep trying. That's what I would say. Yeah. And just to add to that, right? I think it's appropriate that you got to find um, find opportunities for yourself to add value to. Uh, well said uh, chicken on that uh, i think the other piece is um, um look for mentors mentors are are an easy way for you to you know demonstrate your value um, i mean you can walk into any meeting and see certain people sort of light up the room you know in a very dreamy way <laughs> uh my point here is uh, you, you you see people when you know when they speak suddenly the room goes silent people want to listen to them um there's an aura about them even when they say something and walk away from the room sort of you know the, the halo lingers right so this is what is exact presence right um so i'm sure when you look around your own work environment or the, i don't know you know if you go in college and school and universities look around your class look around your campus if you are in a work environment look around your own department there are people that you can see who stand out So, you know, can you make them your mentor? I think that's an easy shortcut for you to look at what picks them, so you can grab some of those picks for yourself. 
And yeah, Arun, last thing that I would like to add because it's such an you know excellent uh, excellent question. And I'll also reflect on some of the things that I personally have you know gone through as well. Like I said, in good light, I ask for help. Uh, I mean, if somebody says, okay, you know, you don't know this, you've been here for some, just ask, you know, can you help me because I want to understand how these things are and can you help me plug it in? Sometimes they, the conversation then becomes about, hey, great, this person is actually willing to kind of take feedback and wants to work and let me kind of take this person under the wings and, you know, it works. So ask for help, right? That's the other thing. And Arun is right. Mentors, find challenging areas and be vocal about the need for help very early, right? It'll always be rewarded, I think. All right. Um, Chetan is asking, how can we prevent our worldview from hindering the productivity of critical conversations and discussions? Oh, I wish there was a formula for this. This is like, this is something that I personally have had a, um, have had battles with. Um, it just it comes down to uh, training also, right? I think uh, a lot of. Uh, um, engineers in India, at least from my generation, our generation would go on to do an MBA. So the two things are so different, right? As an engineer, you're trying to look for the, the most precise fit. Whereas as, an, as, a, as a manager, you're trying to look for the, um, not necessarily the most precise fit, but a fit that works at that point in time, right? Um, and has the greatest uh, currency amongst the team. You also need to drive consensus. So I always say that, you know, a hundred percent perfect solution that has zero percent probability of execution is of no use. You would rather go with a 60 percent uh, precise solution that has hundred percent probability of success. Right? If you do the math, I mean, some of you math aficionados here, you know, 100 into zero is any day less than 60 to 100. <laughs> so, so, you know, it is a battle. It is a battle for you to um, settle for that 60 percent. Um, I suppose just just you know stay the course tell yourself that there is no need for you to be super precise i think very often they say that perfection is the enemy of good right it's very hard for us to digest as a you know, trained engineers but uh, it is what it is i think you just need to go with an open mind i wish i could give you a more specific formula here if i knew it i would write a book and make millions unfortunately i don't have that <laughs> Okay, uh, Neeraj is asking, do we need to focus on company objective or boss objective if both are not aligned? Chetan, you want to uh, jump in first? It's an interesting you had something today, right? <laughs> it's an interesting question. Uh, I think, uh, you know, um, you know, we keep reading all of these HBRs, right? I don't know, I, I was discussing an HBR article, you know, I think something on these lines, um, you know, so it's 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 very interesting, right? How these things would uh, would uh, would line up. Uh, you know, along actually, you know, along the way in my career, I've somehow never had that big challenge of a dichotomy between you know uh, an outcome of an organization versus outcome of your leader. Uh, I think we've all been lucky, at least, and I think Arun as well, that we've been lucky with some good leaders who've been who've stayed aligned. Uh, but I think if you're facing a challenge like this, one of the easiest things I think to do is to go and have a direct conversation just have a direct conversation i mean I, I because because the more you ignore something like this the broader it's going to get and the wider the chasm will get because you will be chasing something that you think is right or not right depending on which goal you decided to align yourself with the company goals or whatever you decide as your uh, perceive as your manager's goals for example um have a direct conversation and go and say look this is what my interpretation of the goals i think are for the organization this is what you're kind of saying I understand them to be slightly different. Don't be confrontational, but just ask, what would you like me to do? Because I just want to understand how this is going to be. Right? Simple. That's one. And also make sure like things like, you know, your checkpoints and stuff like that reflect the goals that you're going to be measured on. At the end of the year, somebody is going to come and have a discussion with you and say, hey, you know, how did this go? How did you do, right? Or end of the year or monthly or whatever the frequencies are. It's very important that you also get these goals documented uh, and say that, you know, this is the agreed goals between uh, you and I, and I'm going to contribute to this North Star. And that needs to be also, you know, documented. So get it documented and have a very open and transparent conversation. Otherwise, it's going to get into a lot of, oh, this happened, oh, this is not going to get solved, right? And, you know, that's that's the key. And, and for me, like, I have had so many excellent bosses and I still have excellent bosses. I mean, it's easy to go to the person and talk and ask them for help and ask them for clarity 
when there is no clarity right like if i'm perceiving as no clarity uh, just go and ask and i think my team does the same with me and i'm always very happy to uh, engage sometimes it's uh, not the easiest conversation to have but have it otherwise you're going to you know face other challenges for yourself that's what i would say and read some of these hpr articles as well there's some very good articles on you know economics and hpr on this topic yeah i think just just for the you know extension of this argument right i think we also need to put ourselves in the shoes of we are the boss then what would we, our behavior be with our employees because some of the people here in the audience i'm sure are managers themselves right so what would we do if our employees are asking these questions about for us so as a manager what would we do to ensure we don't breed that sort of uh, dichotomy of you know the conflict conflicted ideas right so i think here's what i would look at right i mean chetan described what we would do if we have this dilemma with our managers but let me try and talk about what would we do as managers with our employees right i think very often and and this is a thread that i'm picking from chetan right because he did talk about the importance of communication keeping the communication channels going as the manager what form that communication would take i would submit it is about translating breaking down your uh, your your larger objectives what we call as organizational goals or objectives and transmitting it in bite sized chunks that makes sense to your employee very often i see this this challenge of um you know employees asking am i solutioning for the organization am i doing what is right for the organization or am i doing something that's my manager's fancy now this question 90% of the time happens because as a manager we haven't done a good job of clarifying how we are connecting the organization's goals to what i am asking the employee to do so it is a communication challenge it's a challenge of translation of goals i mean if you go and tell you know if you go and tell your employee that we got to deliver you know 3 dollars of eps to the wall street employee is not going to care right but if you translate that into things that make sense for the employee then sure they'll connect if you go and tell the employee oh we, we got to deliver 3 dollars eps to the wall street therefore you come tomorrow morning you know at 6 am and get this file done up on excel it's like you know you're just pushing me to do things that i'm not convinced so as a manager i think we have a responsibility to clarify the goals more clearly when that happens potentially 90% of these you know what am i doing kind of questions will disappear right so a uh, continuation in this ravi is asking how to tackle such a situation when your boss doesn't want you to perform in organization you do whatsoever reason and uh, should we try to be more visible beyond him or better to move on well i mean that's a that's a tough one right i mean because you know you look at you look at the any organization and you know uh, i think one of the most important things is to you know have a very strong uh, relationship a working relationship with your uh, with your managers right along with your peers and your teams and some of the stakeholders if some of them are breaking look i keep going back to the same answer because i always do it you got to have a chat i mean you got to have a discussion and understand where some of this is coming from i mean it's it would be very very uh, you know detrimental if a um, manager for example does not want an employee right that's what the question is right for the for the team member to succeed uh, you got to have a conversation and and i think one of the things i've also kind of learned is this um, what i call the fly, fight or flee strategy uh, which is basically a, a framework as well again so in this case fight is not really like fight it's actually to go and have a discussion and understand where this is coming from what might have happened is there anything that you can actually fix assuming that you think this is salvageable and you want to be in the organization and actually succeed and grow the flee i think is obviously saying you know i it doesn't make any sense for me anymore because it's come to a point of time where i don't see any light uh in this organization and that depends on the individual right because different people have different tolerance levels and one i think uh you know uh yard steak or you know whatever if you will is for you to understand how much this is actually affecting you and if it's affecting you to a point where you it's kind of creeping into your personal life 
and it doesn't make sense anymore you've got to know when to flee which is basically to say i'm going to move on because at the end of the day you're going to go somewhere else and you will be still valued as long as you believe in your skills and you have the competencies and so on right talk have open transparent discussion take feedback and and understand whether this is something that you can fix if you really determine this is unfixable broken beyond repair and you got to take the hard decision and say i'm going to move on because there is life beyond uh, you know the one uh, one opportunity not trust your skills and your yourself that's what i would say it's a tough situation i hope it doesn't happen to anyone great so we'll take the last question for the day uh, this is from fazal what was your biggest challenge in your professional life and how did you face that challenge yeah for me <clears throat> i think in um, in one of the organizations i think the biggest challenge that i faced is i was actually offered a role uh, which i thought was beyond me which is a very different challenge to have right because uh, you know i perceived that this particular role was way beyond my capability and uh, and my experience at that point of time um and uh, you know it was a very difficult conversation to have to first of all make various reasons to say oh, maybe maybe not maybe i need to ask my wife i need to ask my mom and dad and all these things that didn't make any any sense in terms of answers of course they make sense you should check with your wife and mom and dad but for the person whom i was telling to it didn't make a lot of sense as to what i was trying to say um and then i took a lot of time and finally i i took the took the role with a lot of apprehension uh, you know with a with a uh, with a belief that i would not probably succeed right so very few years ago i would say you know, probably 10 plus years ago um but it didn't turn out that way right i mean it, it, the definition of success of course depends on the individual uh, but for me the challenge there was to get into a team where i had people who were a lot more senior than i was who were actually reporting into me uh, it was a massive team spread across uh, geographies uh, and not just in one location um i was new to the organization uh and which is exactly why my apprehensions were because i thought people will tell me hey i told you this guy is not going to do it right he just came in how can he how can he do this right but it worked and i think at the end of the day i came back to the same things i don't i spoke about i was true to myself um i was very vulnerable in terms of what i knew and what i didn't know very early uh, i asked for help uh and it was all very difficult because the fear of failure was always there and i think i learned a lot about how to manage that uh you know fear of failure and how to kind of take people along uh you know how to treat as people with a lot of respect and empathy uh how to work with people who are a lot more senior than you, than you are it's a very difficult thing to do like if you have people who are a lot more competent and experienced than you are how do you work with them like people who are 15 years more experienced in the industry than you are they know a lot i mean it's it's a given they have been seen a lot so uh, i learned a lot it was a big challenge uh, it was i think about a year long uh and it was one of the best learning experiences that i've had every small thing that we did um it went from tentativeness to fun to innovation to acceleration and then we did a lot and it was recognized i think at the end of the, the stint that it was a major uh, major success and um you know i still i still draw a lot of strength from that and i would advise everybody on this call and uh, you know if you get opportunities you know take them on and uh, and you know do your best right i mean and, and trust yourself and uh, you know and don't second guess along the way i right? keep plugging along ask for help find mentors as arun said be vulnerable keep trying uh, and 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 treat everybody with respect uh, you know as you go along so your success will come right? that's what i would say arun i don't know if you want to add anything close in um no i think um, um well said um i just maybe from my personal challenge aspect i guess uh, you know you you all come into careers holding an image of what an ideal professional should look like talk like what you know behave like and so on right um often times you you end up putting on a persona and carrying on with that persona for years together as you start building your careers um it happened with me also i mean i had this notion of you know you got to be you know wearing a tie and you know being the serious person which runs so counter to who i am in real life um and i can tell you it ages you quickly <laughs> faster than your biological reasons can age you right so it aged me faster than uh, you know i should have um i think at some point i realized that this was playing havoc we always think of how your personality you know changes your work but what we don't understand is your work also changes your personality now you got to be careful if if it changes you for the better it's a fantastic thing but you've also got to be wary of the possibility that it may change you for worse 
so um, anyway i think at some point about 8 10 years ago maybe yeah, about 8 years ago um i woke up to this facet of what was happening with me and obviously like chetan said very appropriately in my instance um, um i gave permission to myself to feel vulnerable i think that's that's an important superpower that we should have the superpower of being vulnerable and being accepting about it right so i think speaking to a few mentors understanding that this is normal there's nothing to be you know um, there's nothing to be secretive about it and just you know at some point i guess you know you also say okay you know i'm like halfway or more into my career how does it matter let me just, just be my authentic self the day i decided i'm going to be more authentic to myself i could feel that i was suddenly younger more energetic the burden of work suddenly feels like it's been lifted so anyway i think i can go on but to me that was probably the most self learning exercise or experience of my working career so which is why i i can't emphasize enough about why it's so important for you to be your authentic self um if you are not your authentic self you don't bring your authentic self to work if you are a different person at work and different person at home you are doing yourself and your family and your friends of color and injustice so be your authentic self everything else can get you know great um thank you so much arun and chetan it was a very informative and a very insightful session i'm sure a lot of our learners learned a lot and i personally enjoyed it and uh, thanks to all the learners as well for attending the session and for all the questions um arun we have our ceo mr mohan amongst us and he just like to say a quick hi to you hi hi arun thank you so much for joining in and and good to connect after such a long time Uh, hey Mohan, thank, thank you for the insights. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I I didn't have anything to add. Uh, I would have liked to uh, join this session, but yeah, as, as you can imagine, there were series of meetings. But thank you so much for making time for our students. Our oh, pleasure. It's uh, it's probably one of the best ways to spend a Friday evening in the team earlier. <laughs> uh, and thanks, thanks for taking our time. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, Neeraj, you can end the session.